all of us would sit at the table, mothers, single, no matter who you are, Father, I just pray that they will be blessed today and be touched by the Word, that all of us would leave stronger, that we would leave more equipped to take on this world and all the problems that come our way, Father, that our dads would leave stronger, that our young men would leave stronger in the name of Jesus, Father, to serve you in a really, really wicked, evil world, Father, that we would be a bright light to those around us and let people know that there is a right way to live in this time to where it looks like everybody's just living crazy, Father. Then, Father, there is truth, and I just thank you, Lord, that it would be revealed to us today in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen, amen, amen. Okay. And we are live, so we welcome all of y'all, okay? Um, I need to get rid of this. Do we have something? (laughs) I got something in there. Yeah. Oh. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I was going to eat it, but I didn't eat it. Hallelujah. All right. It might take a deep breath. We're going to have a good time today. I also wanted to, before we get started, you're going to get a text later on today from us, and it's going to be in reference to our involvement in the McDonough High School over here, okay? So I'm going to send you a text. It's going to have a form on there of certain things you'd like to get involved in. Just look at it and think about it and just see what areas you think you might can help out because we really do want to get involved in this high school, but it's going to take all of us to be able to do it. So just look at it and uh, pray about it and uh, just fill it out, and uh, it will all go back to Miss uh, Lori. So she'll uh, either follow up with you or we'll get a list together. We'll, we'll make it all happen. So so today, I want to honor all the fathers here today, which we see. Now we got nine fathers here today, okay? And that's not an easy task, okay? And it's not one that you go to school and learn. Do we have anybody that's still in school here? Okay. All right. Got some? They don't have a class that teaches you on how to be a father. They don't have a class on that. They don't, t- they don't, they don't have a lot of classes have on how to be a husband. <laughs> How to be a wife, okay? They need to have two classes for how to be a wife. You know what I'm saying? But anyway, we need, I'm just kidding. Y'all don't need a lot of help. We need a lot of help. We need multiple classes. But really, we don't have this. So when we get in life and we have a kid, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a shock. I mean, your whole world stops. Things happen. Things quit happening. <laughs> you, have to, you have to draw back. The responsibility goes to another level. What you used to do as a teenager whether good or bad, well, I'd really say rather bad because I don't know, I was a teenager that did bad things. I couldn't bring that over into my kid's life because I didn't want them doing that. For many of y'all know my testimony, I was raised in a really a drug infested, a lot of drinking, a lot of alcohol. That was the environment I was raised in. So I was headed down that same road. Well, when I have kids, I don't want them kids to experience what I experienced. You know, hanging out of windows, trying to get in your house, and, you, and you're vomiting on the toilet, and you're, you're, you're passing out, and you're having to pull over on the side of the road because you're too drunk. That's not what I want my kids to be doing. Amen? So thank God, by the grace of God, I met Jesus, and then I began to start changing my life to where now I look at my kids, and now they're a product of us living for God. Got the good news uh, yesterday. My son and his wife are moving down from Tennessee to Henry County. That's good news, man. That is good news. And then we'll have all five of our kids in, in, a, in a really about a 20-mile radius. So we're all going to be together. And I really believe, man, they're all going to be in here. They're going to be jumping around. They're going to be having a good time with us. But I can promise you, like most of you dads, I made a lot of mistakes as a dad. Even serving Jesus Christ, even taking my kids to church, choosing to do things right, I still messed up. Because how many of you know kids can make you mad? They can make you real mad. I don't care how cute they are. They can make you mad. They can do things. But how many of you know, parents, we can make them mad. <laughs> it works both ways. You know what I'm saying? But, but it's something to where when you, when you do have the kids, it's almost like you begin on a whole other journey of what am I going to do with this kid? How am I going to raise this kid? Because you have to change some of the things that you used to do because now you want that kid to be better than you. You don't want that kid to look at you one day and go, wow. I don't want to be like you. Do we have that going on in our society? Yeah, we have a lot of that going on. Now, thank God for my dad. He showed me a lot of great things. He taught me how to change my brakes. He taught me how to change my oil. He gave me a toolbox when I graduated, not a bunch of money. But I still have that toolbox to this day. So, again, I'm very thankful for all that my dad taught me. But, again, there was a lot of things that I didn't get that I had to learn on the job, okay? And I didn't always do it right, amen? Amen. So some here today, you had a great father when you was being raised. 
And some of you teenagers in here, you may think, you know, well, I, I think I got a great dad. You'll think better about that later on maybe, but you do have a great dad, okay, especially if he's in church today. Some have a father that has left this earth, but the memories you will have for a lifetime. Some of y'all had a dad that you still can lay in bed at night and just think, wow, man, he was a good man. He did so many good things for me. He did so many things good, good for my kids. You just think about him and you go, wow, and her dad was one of them. My gosh, man, I just, I aspire to be like her dad. I mean, when you, he just, man, when you showed up, everybody was, you know, part of the family. Come on, man, get on up here. Welcome, you know, didn't matter if he, he knew you or not, you know. And then if you ever decided to leave, where are you going? Where are you going, man? Come on, stay for a little bit longer. Just made everybody feel good all the time. Just a great man, you know. Sometimes, I don't know if you're like me. And no, no, I don't mean this to be against anybody, okay. But when you have a large crowd over your house and they begin to start dwindling out, I'm not getting bummed out, okay. I'm thinking, whew, I am, I mean, I'm ready for a little relaxation, okay. He just go on and on and on. And I think the people around him be like, man, come on, man, let him go home. Yeah, we're good. But he was just a really sweet, loving guy. Uh, some did not get to spend much time or any time with your dad or he was always gone. You know, Every father should remember one day your son or daughter will follow your example, not your advice. One day they're going to follow your example, not just what you told them. They're going to follow what you, and that's what I was doing. I was literally following the image that I actually had saw, drinking, partying. Now, again, I worked hard because my, both my mom and dad worked hard, but I lived for the weekend so I could, well, I could drink and I could do things and, you know, uh, uh, just play poker, just doing stuff that, it really wasn't going to bring me a lot of good return in the future. A good father is one of the most unsung, unpraised, unnoticed, and yet one of the most valuable assets in our society. Billy Graham quoted that. And they are. And it's sad because the U.S. Census Bureau says that there's 18.3 million children, one in four, that live without a biological step or adoptive father in the home. Father, fatherlessness is an epidemic that transcends racial, culture, and socioeconomical barriers. It is a problem in our world we live in. You know, talking to Pastor Terrell of the Malachi Project, he says in Henry County, it's like a 85, almost 90 percent uh, what they're seeing. I mean, the rate of fathers, fatherlessness in this county is really astronomical. And it's sad, okay? Because you can be a father at home but not be there. You can you can be a father because, guys, what we realize, what I've realized as a father, I want to provide. I want to protect. But I'm not so crazy about getting down here and teaching every little thing. Hey, baby, come here. Let's teach. Let me teach you how to do this and do that. I'm more about, hey, look, I'm providing a roof. I got the bacon on the table. I'm doing this right here. But, dads, your role in your kid's life, even to the very little minute detail, really it starts with just noticing them. Just noticing them, keeping your eye on them, letting them know you're always there, encouraging them all the time. I mean, when they're young, uh, and, 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 and I, I, we did this as parents, there wasn't hardly any game that we didn't go to. And if we couldn't go to it because of different locations, then one of us was going to be there. But I'd get off work to go to the high school games. I was at every game. I, I would change my schedule. I'd do whatever it took because I'm telling you, your kids are looking in the stands. They want to see if you're there. But they don't want to see you there going crazy. Come on, man, what are you doing? Hit the ball, you stupid, come on. They don't want to see that, okay? They'd rather look up there and not see you if you're going to do that, okay? And if you've been on the ball field long enough, everybody has spotted that parent. There is those parents that like to do that, okay? I was that coach and parent, okay? I would, you know, scream it. You know I mean? Come on, son, what are you doing, man? Do you have eyes in your head? Can you see the ball? Hit the ball, man, come on. So uh, we don't want to be that guy or that girl. But at the same time, your kids are looking at you, and they're looking for your affirmation, even when they become older, y'all. I mean, it blesses me to sit around yesterday, and, and my kids bringing me a card, and what they write in the card, that you're an awesome father. And I look at them, I'm going to look in the mirror going, I don't know about all that. You know what I'm saying? Thank you. But, I mean, I missed it a lot. But, but again, I'm telling you, just, just, just seeing your kids develop, Seeing your kids know you care about them all the way through. Be their number one fan. Be there for them. When they do something and they screw up, look, there ain't no kid 
including you when you was a kid, that needed any affirmation about your stupidity. When you mess up, you know you messed up, okay? I mean, let's, let's figure out how we can get out of stupid, okay, and get into intelligence. Because, again, there ain't no teenager on the planet of the earth. As much as they think they know, they're going to be stupid at times. But, again, there is no parent, there's no adult in this room that ain't been stupid at times. We've all been there, okay? And, again, we don't need to be beating each other over the head, but let's encourage one another. Keep your home like a place where encouragement. Don't let your kids go running into a bedroom, shut the door, and watch TV and YouTube for two or three hours. Okay? These devices were not made to replace you. And in most cases, they have. In most cases, we see you go out to eat. What has just about everybody at the table got in their hand? Not a fork and a knife. <laughs> I mean, sometimes we forget that and use the phone as something as a spoon or something. I don't know. But I mean, these people have to have their phone. And if they leave their phone, oh, gosh, man, where's my phone at? Man, you know, I got to go to the car to get my phone real quick. I'll be right back, you know. And you see them handing them to kids, you know, when they get somewhere and they start getting a little rowdy. Oh, my goodness. Wait, wait, wait. What movie do you want to watch? Here you go, son. Go ahead. Go watch this. Well, no, they won't you. They won't you. And being a parent, being a dad, it takes work. It's work. And for dads, we work hard all day. We don't want to come home and work all night. I mean, kids, can't y'all just chill out? I've been working all day, man. Come on. Save that for somebody else. No, they need you. They need you. Your daddy in heaven, my daddy in heaven, is never going to look down out of heaven and go, you know what, I'm busy. I'm tired. I don't have time. I've been working hard. He's always got time for us. And as dads, we just got to continue to pour it on to our kids, even when they're being rebellious or not doing the things you want them to do. Encourage them, encourage them, encourage them. Fifteen-plus million families in the U.S. are single-mother households. I think there's going to be a special reward for all those single mothers that get to heaven. And they raise their kids to their best ability. I just believe there is. Because I'm going to tell you something. It's work raising kids with a dad and a mother. But how these mothers are able to do this, work a job and raise these kids, I'm telling you, and my mom was one of them. She worked through the night, but she raised me and my brother. I believe there's going to be a special reward for that because that takes a lot of work. It does. And there's, there's single dads that are doing it too. And it's, it's a job. It was never intended to be that way. You get married, you get married for life. Not for a few months, not for a few years. Oh, it's going good. We're happy. We love each other. And then one of them maybe gains a little too much weight. Maybe one of them's just not as attractive as it was when you first got married 10 years ago. And now all the while you forget to look in the mirror that you may not be as attractive as you were 10 years ago. Just being real, okay? Uh, you know what you look like with nothing on. But I got to tell you, we were real quick to judge somebody else. Well, you know, man, there must be something else out there that's hotter. No, nah, she got problems. <laughs> Just like the one you got got problems. Be looking across the fence at another cow in another pasture thinking that cow's going to be better. No, that cow's the same. I mean, it's all the same. Maybe a different color. Maybe a different little shape. Okay? I'm just telling you, women are women. <laughs> they are women. Okay? So if you got one that loves God and loves you, hang on, brother. Hang on, okay? No matter what, you know, uh, Delilah's asking or showing you, you know, off from the distance there. You know, like, woo, check out. Oh, she's hot. She's hot. Yeah, she may have a hot mess in her life, too. You know what I'm saying? So, no, you, you marry for life. Hallelujah. We don't marry for just a little while. Seven plus million fathers are absent from the, the lives of their children. Seventy-one percent of high school dropouts are from fatherless homes. 85% of youth in prison grew up in a fatherless home, y'all. 85% of the people that are in the prison that we just gave those things to came from probably a fatherless home. Man, I don't want to see that happen. I don't want to see that happen in here. Father sometimes can be the world's worst at having a carrot dangled over in front of them, and then they just run and try to catch that carrot overlooking the joy of what you have at home for some mirage and some fake phony stuff out ahead. Dads, let's don't be that way. Let's don't chase those images. Let's don't chase those things that, that they appear and then they're gone. No. Let's embrace what we have. Thank God what we have. Love what we have. 
Endure what we have and watch God do for you what you can't do for yourself. Amen? Endure the fight. Nobody said that marriage was going to be easy. And if they did, they ain't married. I'm telling you, when you get married, it is two separate individuals that come together with two separate different philosophies <laughs> and ideas of how you should fold the clothes, how you should cook the egg, how you should fold uh, the toilet paper, which I've been ruined by Austin McCown. I can't do toilet paper, but one way now, over the top. It's got to go over the top. It's got to go over the top. If I walk in a restaurant and it's not over the top, it's going to be over the top, okay? I never looked at toilet paper until he came to my house and spent a few hours together. I'm thinking, dear God, now I'm ruined, okay? Don't put the toilet paper like that. It ain't under, it's over top, right? It's over top, right? It's over top. Who likes it under? It's got to be over top? Y'all like it? Who cares? <laughs> I didn't care until he did that, and I got an image forever etched in my head, you know? Hallelujah. Fatherless children are more likely to divorce or dissolve their cohabiting unions which I'm not big on cohabiting, okay? I'm more about the uh, marriage, okay? And are more likely to have children outside of marriage or outside any partnership. Fathers have great influence in the home, and their presence in their children's life has a great impact on them. Teenagers may think they are smarter than their fathers. Have y'all ever had that disease? Gosh, my parents are stupid. What are they thinking? They're dumb as a load of bricks. Am I the only one that had that thought when I was going to school? I mean, what do they mean I can't go to this party? Do they understand? They don't understand. They, they're, they're out of touch. My mom and dad are so old, they're out of touch. They ain't got a clue. See, we, we think we know a lot. We think we're really, really smart. <laughs> and I did. I went through that, that phase, too. But they will soon learn that fathers are smarter than they realize. You know, Mark Twain once said, he said, When I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant. I could hardly stand to have the old man around. But when I got to be 21, I was astonished at how much the old man learned in seven years. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, it is it's crazy. Especially when you go to school with a bunch of counselors that are the same age as you. And we're sitting around at the lunch table getting advice from people that ain't got a clue about life. But yet we're going to drum up this plan of how we're supposed to do it. Are you sitting around a, a restaurant with, you know, some 21 or 23 or 25-year-olds, and we discussing how we're going to just change and do all this and how we should do relationships, how we should do this and do that? I'm thinking, really? Most of them at the table done been broke up five times and can't keep no steady job, but yet we're all going to sit here and take advice from each other. No, 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 no. That's, that's not it. You find somebody like Pastor Nathan that has gray hair, and you go, hey, Pastor, let's sit down and talk. I know you're 30 years older than me. I don't want to see. I don't want anybody to see us hanging out. But hey, could you give me some advice? Can I can I sit down and talk to you and Belinda? Can I sit down and talk to you? Find Miss Cindy, huh? Miss Mary, Miss Connie. Okay, Andrew and them's getting there. They're in the 30s. You know, they're getting close. They're almost at that age where we start seeking out advice. Okay, that, that, it, it, yeah, Scott's way up there. We got one right here. This guy right here. What's your name, sir? Fred. Fred has been married to his wife. Now he didn't leave his wife to come to church today. Okay. He's been married to his wife, you said 58 years, right? 58 years. So if I'm going to get some advice from somebody, am I going to go talk to somebody that's been married two years? Really? No, 58 years. Did, did you do everything right? No. Did she do everything right? No. no. They've learned a lot, okay? But, but you can learn how to make something work versus getting with a bunch of people that don't have your marriage, you know, at, at, at the front. Okay, hey, man, come party with me. Hey, bro, let's do this, let's do that. Come on, bro, let's live it up. You'll have this kind of advice from people that don't really care. So you seek out people that are older than you. You know, when I got saved, I got saved right before my 21st birthday. How many of you know what you do at 21? What you can do. I can legally go in there and order a margarita. And they say, let me see your license. No problem, no. Here you go. Go fix my margarita. I could have did that, but now I'm saved, so I, you know, I can't, you know, I mean, I still could do it, and, you know, according to some <laughs> Christians, it, it, you can, it's okay, but it's not okay, okay, it wasn't okay, all right, so uh, I got saved before my 21st birthday, and so I had, I couldn't, I couldn't do none of that, what did I do, 
I found all the old people in our church, and it wasn't much bigger than this at the time, okay, at all. But I found those that were older, and I said, you know what? I want to hang around y'all. I want to go out to eat with y'all. I want to talk to y'all. I want to, I want to get y'all's advice. And I'm still close to them to this day. But now they're well up into their 70s and some even in their 80s. I'm telling you, man, and not that I don't hang around people my age. I do. I love them. I mean, I did stuff with people my age, but I just didn't take a lot of advice from them. Because they don't have mine or my family's best interest at heart. So dads, choose your friends wisely. Choose the hobbies that you go do and the people you go do them with wisely. If I love to fish, there are only certain people getting in this boat. All right? Number one, you love family. Number two, you love God. Well, really, it's backwards. Okay, love God, love family. All right? And number two, you, you, you don't talk politics when I get my boat. Okay, we're not going to talk politics. It runs all the fish away. All right? We ain't going to sit here and argue in the boat because I ain't going to get no fish. All right? But I mean, seriously, you're going to have people in that boat that are absolutely thinking like you. I'm not going to have people in my boat going, and I, I'm just using boat, okay? It could be a golf cart. It could be a Braves game. It could be whatever. Just boats kind of just, you know, flowing out of me right now. But be, be cautious who you have running with you. I mean, I see so many people, man, they absolutely get excited about God. They're excited about going to church. They're excited about serving Him. Then they get to hanging around people, and they start dragging them back into another way of living. And I'm telling you, man, the most, the most, Precious people are the people in church, period. I'm telling you, I know. I've been doing this for a long time, okay? So hang out with people that really are pretty cool, amen? That's church people. And this is what I'm about to say. I think it's really important. As a head coach at UCLA, John Wooden, he won 10 NCAA championships in a 12-year period. In his memoirs, A Lifetime of Reflections on and off the court, he writes, the best thing a father can do for his children is to love their mother. Love their mother. You want to love that mama. Don't put your kids before mama. And mama, don't put your kids before papa. Because <laughs> one day, the kids going to be gone. And you're going to be sitting there looking at mama. And she's going to be like, who are you? <laughs> You don't want that to happen. Man, love. Man, I, I tell you, I would cherish her. If there's one thing that my kids, all five of them, could tell you without me being even around, if you ask them, does Nathan love Belinda? I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt what they're going to say. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that's what you want to do. They seem a good relationship. And even when I missed it as a dad, they still grew up knowing that I love that woman right there. I still hear that from them. You know, she, I think she's even heard that. They said, you know, we appreciate you loving my mother. Because I have five kids. Two are my biological kids. Three are not. But you would never know that because all five of them, in my eyes, are my biological kids. They're mine, okay? And I love them all the same. But they all see me loving their mother. And to love, love that woman. Love her, love her. You'll be, hey, you'll be grateful you did when they get gone, okay? I promise you. All right? It gets good. Ain't that right, Brother Ryan? You'll come up here and tell them how good it is. Come on. Rag and roll. <laughs> She'll get up here and tell the truth. <laughs> nah. uh, children need their father, and sadly, we have an absence of fathers in our world today. When the father is absent, then the kids do not see them loving their mom or helping them learn how to be a man or be a lady. The devil has been after our fathers from the beginning, and he's still out for them. He works to keep fathers working hard. Number one thing that I believe he does, he tries to keep them working. Work. I got to 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 work. Hey, man, you going to the men's Bible thing tonight? No, I got to work. Hey, you going uh, You going to church? Uh, I got to work. 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 No, what you need to say is I'm choosing to work. And I'm choosing not to put my faith and trust in God. Am I, am I for being lazy? No. You need to work. But sooner or later, you've got to draw the line in the sand and go, you know what? There's some things that are important besides job. And my family's important. Not money. We need it, but we can't serve it. Amen? But we've got to put God in the slot where he, where he needs to be. Amen? Don't put him just in the bottom. Hallelujah. Also, drinking, doing drugs, hobbies. I mean, you see men, man, they're more involved in their hobbies than they are in anything in life. You know what? They connive. You know, men are the... <laughs> Men know how to direct a conversation to go their way. 
especially if it's something they want to do, and they have a heart to do it, we have a way to manipulate the situation to where it, it sounds like I need to do this. Men, don't do that. Don't choose hobbies over your family. I really say this. When you get married and when you start having kids, you pretty much need to die to all that and let it happen organically with your family. Let your family be a part of that. Like I just bought a motorcycle. If she ever gets to the place to where she does not want to be on a motorcycle anymore, that motorcycle's gone. It's out of here. Because my best friend's going to be on the back of that motorcycle with me. We're not going to. Because, you know, according to Kevin, guys can't ride on the back of a guy's motorcycle. They can, but they got to face the other way. They have to look the other way. They can't be, you know, I ain't going to have no dude. Hey, you doing good, man. Oh, wow, I thought no, ain't happening, okay? We're best friends. We do everything together. My kids know if we're going to a Braves game, you better get an extra ticket. She's going with us. That's just the way it is. We go everywhere together. We're best friends, period. Not that I don't hang out with other people. But, man, that's my, that's my girl there. So if I've ever got a hobby, no matter what it is, if I'm doing golf, she may not can even hit the ball at all hardly. She's going to be in that golf cart. She's going to be trying. Hallelujah. Same thing with fishing. If I was a fisherman and I like to fish, she would be in there fishing, okay? Or we wouldn't be fishing. <laughs> I'd be doing something else, okay? And I know, I'm, you know, again, work on it, guys. Work on it. Work on that wife. Come on, baby. You can do it. You can catch that big five, 20-pound bass. You can do it. <laughs> and, uh, and then distractions, guys. The devil throws distractions at men all the time. Fathers, I want to say to you that you are a man of God, and you will live for him all the days of your life, and you will show your kids the way to God and the way to live for him because they're watching. They're watching you. Today I want us to look at the, great, uh, the greatest father that ever existed, and it is our Heavenly Father. Then I want to look at a man named Abraham. Real quick, we're just going to go through this pretty quick. In Psalms 103.13, it says, the Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. God gives us an example to how we are to be towards our kids, tender and compassionate. And I would say these are two words that you don't really see talked about too much amongst men. You know, men don't get together and go, man, what you, how's your tenderness going? How tender are you being, man? Are you being real tender? No, we, we usually talk about UFC. You know, <laughs> I mean, what giant did you tackle? You know, whatever. But we're called to be tender and compassionate like our Heavenly Father to our kids. They need to see that. Okay, yeah, they need to see your strength. They need to see you being strong. But let them, let them see your tenderness and compassion as well. God is so good to us, and He desires for us to, to call Him Father because when we look at how He fathers all His kids, then we will be like that to our kids. So we see God and how He fathers according to the Word, and then we just duplicate that. God is a God to sinners, but he is a father to those that have been born into the family of God. Our Heavenly Father shows us how to be a father in Hebrews 12. I'm going to read a few passages right here, but dads and moms, I want you to lean in, okay? In verse 5, it says, and, I, and have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? He said, my child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline, and don't give up when he corrects you. Does God discipline? Yes, yes. And he does it because he loves you. Does God correct? Yes, he does, because he loves us. For the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. Verse 7, as you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Who ever heard of a child who is never disciplined by its father? If God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means you are an illegitimate and not really his children at all. Since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the Father of our spirits and live forever? For our earthly father disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how. But God disciplines, but God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. No discipline is enjoyable while it is happening. It's painful. Has anybody ever got a whipping before? I mean, got a belt and got a whipping, okay? I mean, my dad, he'd whip that belt off, and he'd go to whipping. I'm talking about back in the day, there was, no, there was no borders. I mean, you just beat your kids back then. You know what I'm saying? They got away with it. And he would. He'd rip that belt off. And my brother, he was notorious for going to getting a pillow and putting a pillow back there. I just took it because I knew if I did that, I was going to get double trouble. And he did. He got double. But I don't blame him for trying because it hurt, y'all. There was nothing joyful about it, okay? Nothing at all. I hated it, you know? 
But what I hated more than that is restriction. Did anybody have parents that would restrict you for like, you know, you can't go nowhere for two weeks, you can't go nowhere for a month? Well, my dad one time gave me an option. He said, he said Nathan, look, he said, uh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to discipline you. I'm going to I'm gonna, I'm gonna get on to you now. And, uh, you know, you, you, you got, you're going to get restricted, okay? Um, but, but also, you know, uh, no, how did he say it? He gave me the option to whether I could get restricted or get a whipping. I said, beat me, man. Because it only lasted for a little while, and I could actually do some things. Whip me, man. Let's do this thing, okay? Some kids don't know what a belt feels like. And see, as, as young kids, especially in the culture we live, because the school systems have completely changed, you don't see a, 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 a principal with a paddle. Those days are over, okay? So in our school days, we did big paddle, holes in it. We talked about it. Man, he had holes in that thing. Pull it out of that front drawer, pull it out, and he would wear you out. Now we got time out. Okay, we're going to put you in time out. How's that working? That ain't working. That ain't working at all. Okay, have y'all seen some of these high school classrooms? I mean, they got them on YouTube. It don't take long. Just go home and type some up and see what, they, see what the teachers are facing with in high school and see some of the conversations, some of the kids and how they're acting. Hey, man, 50 years ago, that kid, his nose would be broke. He'd be having a broke arm. And they'd throw him out the back door. Nowadays, you can't do nothing. You got to just sit there and watch that crap go on. It's changed because we're going to put kids in timeout. We're going to put the timeout. We, 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 we stir away from what God said. He said, you spare the rod, what are you going to do next? Spoil the child. We have leaders now that are in office that, that will say that that's ludicrous. I mean, you shouldn't do that. You should never touch your kid with something like that. I'm going to be honest with you. It didn't hurt me at all. And I believe God, that's why he did. I mean, if there's any part of your body, even if you're lean, I mean, even if you are lean, I mean, you don't have no fat on you at all, reach behind you and grab one of your cheeks. I can promise you, my friend, it ain't going to be firm. Not unless you are Mr. Universe. And those guys right there are probably Miss Universe. I mean, I don't know how they do it. I mean, some of them guys in, in those competitions, they turn around and they do something like this right here. And I don't think they got any fat on them. I'm going, bro, <laughs> really? Your cheeks <laughs> are like that? I mean, come on, man. I'm just trying to get an arm to look as good as what you got, man, not the cheek, you know what I'm saying? But your cheek has a little extra cushion back here. Even when you tense it, you can probably still pinch a little bit on it, you know? It's meant to get a little bit of this. So when you have kids in your house and you refuse to do it God's way, but yet you're going to do it the culture's way, well, then guess what? It's going to be harder for you as you go on. Now, we're not saying beat your kid. Don't do that. Never do that. But look, man, getting a little paddle, I had what they called a sin buster in my house. It was a sin buster. That means we bust the sin out of you. You're going to act like the devil? We're going, we're going to bust it out of you. Amen? And we would paddle them. It didn't hurt none of them kids. Okay? And uh, it's not going to hurt none of your kids. So, hey, let the correction. It'll be, it'll, it'll be painful, but it'll help. But he, say, he goes on to say at the end of this, he says, but afterward there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. How many of y'all after getting a whipping a couple weeks, a month later, you found yourself not doing that no more? When your, your friends go, hey man, let's go do this. You had this sudden uh, you know, uh, pain that come up through your butt. And you go, nah bro, don't think I'm interested. I remember the last time I did that, man, I got tore up for doing that. See, we got to bring that back to the home. We got to bring that back because, guys, look, a good whipping ain't gonna hurt your kid. Well, I don't want to make my baby cry. Oh, can't stand to see him cry. Listen, you want to keep your baby out of jail, so they may cry a little bit. It ain't gonna hurt them, okay? What hurts them is when you don't discipline them. And don't get me wrong, man. When they're a little like Asher, I mean, I'm sure he does stuff around the house. Cause I remember, you know, little kids they'll do some stuff. It's wrong, but you laugh. <laughs> you can't help but laugh. You know what I'm saying? It's funny. I would encourage you to go around the corner, you and your wife, and laugh. Have a belly buster. Then come back around and go, Asher, you know, we need to talk, bro. We can't do that no more. You know what I'm saying? Because you're trying to get them going down the right road. All right? Don't let their cuteness keep you from doing what God's called you to do. Because I'm going to tell you something. And if you're a parent that likes discipline your kids, you need to give your kids to somebody else for a little while. Because I never wanted to discipline my kids. Now when they first did it, maybe. There was a certain 
blood pressure rise. You're like, man, well, you're going down, you know. But after a while, you cool down. But no, no, you, you should want to do it because you see the future for them. You see the future for them. And that's what God does to us. Ain't y'all glad God corrects us? I mean, when you're riding in the road, he's whispering in your ear, why are you doing this? Well, because I want to. Well, he keeps on talking to you for a little while. You go, oh, man, I'm, I repent. I'm, I'm sorry. I shouldn't do that. We as fathers are to do to our kids the way God does to his kids. Correct and love your children. Do not let the mother be the one doing all the correcting. Hallelujah. It's easy. <laughs> do not hurt your kids, but lead them with correction and love. If you do not correct them, then when they get older and God comes to correct them, they will not listen. That's how valuable it is. So your faithfulness in correcting them and loving them sets them up to be able to handle the correction when God brings it to them. Amen? And it don't, if you do it, man, if you do it when they're young, it don't have to be violent. Okay? You don't have to whip your belt off and do all that. It can be just a simple pat on the bottom and, and go on, and it's not that big a deal. So how many dads have aggravated their kids or picked on them? Does anybody else pick on their kids? I do. Oh, man, that's fun. Hey, come on, man. I mean, I used to, you know, Maverick used to hate it. He, his bedroom was in the back, and there was an empty bedroom right over here. And it, he'd always shut the door before he went to bed, you know, because he he thinks something was in there. Well, man, I'd go in there with the door about half cracked. I'd put a sheet over me. I'd be sitting there on the bed looking like I was a pile of clothes. And I'd see him coming. I, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, was, I, I, I did. I did some, I was crazy. Yeah, I did some stuff. I enjoyed it. It's fun picking on your kids. And just picking on them, you know what I'm saying? Just pick because you can. They're small. I got you. I mean, when you're picking on somebody like, you know, you've seen Andrew picking on Scotty. Okay, that's not, they do that all the time. But see, Scotty's going to get him, all right? Where Asher's going to be a hard time getting him. It's a little different, you know, gap there, okay? Uh, not much. But <laughs> it's just a little bit, okay? But the point is, is, you know, it's easy to pick on our kids, Amen. But Paul gives us fathers some good advice in Ephesians 6, 4. He says, fathers, do not pick on your kids. <laughs> do not aggravate them to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with a discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Not only did he say it one time, but he said, let me say it again to the Colossian church. In, in chapter 3, verse 21, he says, fathers, do not aggravate your children or they will become discouraged. So he must have known that there was something in men that likes to do that. Why would he say it? He didn't say that to mothers. Okay? So we got to be careful how we talk to our kids and how we, how we lead them. So Paul felt that it was so important that he put it in two of his letters to the church. Fathers, we are called to be men of God. Godly fathers that lead our house to heaven, not to hell. We're called to lead them to heaven. Do you, you're, when I say that, fathers, you're called to lead the family. Mothers are called to lead the family, but they're different roles, okay? You're both very important, but there's something that God's put on men to do something. And if we don't do it, it ain't going to get done. And it's just a proven fact that you can take a family of five people, and you got three kids, a mother, and a father. And if all five of them don't go to church, and all of a sudden three of the kids go to a youth camp and they get on fire for God. They go home and they tell their mom and daddy, whoa, man, God's good. He saved me. I don't have to go to hell. I get to go to heaven. He's amazing. They're excited about serving God. There's about a 7 or 8% chance that the mom and daddy's going to go to church. Now, if the mom goes to church and gets on fire for God, it's about a 15% chance that the whole family will start coming. Now, these are statistics I didn't make up, okay? All right, these are statistics that they've actually done. I don't know how they do it, but it's just statistics. But if the daddy gets on fire for God in a family of five, there is a 90-plus percent chance that all the family is going to come in to the things of God. So there's power in us men, and the devil knows that. And if he can keep us occupied and busy and distracted, then he's going to keep our families from being all they're called to be. And when you have kids in your family, they are meant to see God in you first before they ever see God for themselves. And unfortunately, because they don't see God at home, it takes somebody outside the home to introduce them to God. Now, I'm not saying there will still not be. If they see God in you, that somebody outside the home may lead them to God. But they need to see God in you, in you every single day. Romans 4, 
Well, let, me, let, me, let me do this, okay? We show our family how to live for God, and then we demonstrate it before them just like Abraham did. Romans 4, 19. Now, Abraham was a Bible character that demonstrated how to follow God. He left his own country at 75 years old, a place that he was only known. It's all he knew was the Ur of Chaldeans. That's where he was from. That's all he knew, but he left it because God told him to leave it. So he left that, and then he began to start walking with the God and walking with him and fellowshipping with him, and, and God gave him a child in his old age. And we've talked about this in extent, extensively, that God, <laughs> you don't see 90-year-old people getting pregnant today. But God had promised Abraham a child, and Abraham said, yes, I'll take that child, even when his wife was barren and she couldn't have kids. So he began to start walking after God, doing what God called him to do, and God began to bless Abraham and bless his family to the point that we're still talking about Abraham and the blessing of Abraham even to this day. But in Romans chapter 4, verse 19, it says, And Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though at about a hundred years of age he figured his body was as good as dead, and so was Sarah's womb. Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger. In, in this, he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promised. So God gave Abraham and Sarah a baby when he was 100 and she was 90. Now, brother, I know you and your wife have been married for 58 years. And if God was to come to you guys and say, man, I'm going to give you all a baby. Y'all probably, yeah, that's exactly, yeah. I don't blame you. Okay? But even if, you know, they said, yes, Lord, we'll take the baby. And then they went to the doctor and they said, Doc, the Lord has told us that we're going to have a child. The doctor would probably look at them and say, okay, yeah, man. I mean, you know, we're praying for you, man. You take it easy, man. You know what I'm saying? Because it's just not a common thing. But see, God does uncommon things for common people. He does the impossible to show that he's God. Could God have chose a younger couple to do that? He could have. But again, if you can do something in this life without God, do you really need God? God specializes in taking something that can't happen and making it happen through uncommon people that don't believe it's not able to make it happen. God is the one that does the impossible things, y'all. He can take our lives, which really, guys, everybody in this room at one point in time or the other, besides my wife, you probably messed up your life. You probably made some decisions you wish you wouldn't have made. We went some directions we shouldn't have went. But God took that, and now he's turned it around, and look at where you're at right now. He specializes in that, making you something when it looks like you're nothing. That's the God we serve. Abraham trusted God with his whole life and lived for him in a world just like ours. He had to choose to have faith in God to have a kid at 100 years of age. He had to have faith in God to leave his hometown and move away, not knowing where God was taking him. Abraham was obedient to do what God told him to do, and God gave him a child and blessed him and his family just like he said he would do. Abraham is an example of a life committed to God, and in doing that, he gave that life of faith to his children. The godly life Abraham lived is still being talked about thousands of years after he died. Men, the Lord has issued the call for godly men. He is looking for men who will take up the cross and follow him. He is looking for men who will walk with him consistently, who will take a stand for righteousness, and who will invest their lives in something that will last for generations to come. He is looking for godly leaders willing to lead others. He's looking for those who are willing to become godly men. Real quick, in Colossians 3, 1, it says, Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of the earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And I want to skip down to verse 10. And it says, Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your Creator and become like Him. That's the goal, is to become like him. And I, know, I don't know about you guys, but when you have a good father figure, when you have a good mother figure, there's, a, there's something on the inside of you that says, I want to be like them. 
I want to be like them. I want to be successful like them. Maybe it's a boss. Maybe it's somebody, you know, uh, on your job that you look at and you go, man, they're successful. I'd like to be like them. There's nothing wrong with that. But the greatest one we want to image bear is God Almighty. Amen. We want to be like him. God has called us to be like him on the earth. When we are like him, we will love like him, lead like him, care like him, and be that godly dad to our children and our wife. We will be the godly man of our homes, and we will raise godly kids. So my question to you today as we close, are you that kind of man? Are you that kind of man? If not, what's holding you back? Let today be the day you answer the call to be a godly dad. Let's all bow our head and close our eyes. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. And I just thank you, Father, for every single dad here, every single person here. And there may be people here in the sound of my voice that don't know you, don't have a personal relationship with you. First, I want to pray for all the dads in this room. If you're a dad and you say, you know what, Pastor, what you're saying, I understand it, but I, I haven't been doing it. Or you, you understand it and you just need help doing it, maybe doing it better. God wants to help you. He's not against you. He's for you, dads. But he's got to have your cooperation. If you don't work with him, there's nothing he can do. You as a dad have to say, you know, God, here, come help me. Help me do this. And the minute you do that, you're going to see things going the right direction. Trust me, man. Maybe some of you dads have just been struggling and struggling and struggling in areas. Have you ever thought that it's because you're trying to do it? Have you ever thought that maybe you're just in the way and you just need to invite God into the situation? I really believe if you'll make that determination, and like the Scripture said, if you will carry your cross, if you'll die today and say, God, live in me, live through me, help me be the dad that I know you've called me to be. Your kids need it. Your wife needs it. This world needs it. So just while you're sitting there, I want you just to think, is the Holy Spirit talking to you? And if he is, I want you just to be bold and say, Pastor, I, I would really love it if you would pray for me. Just pray for me. We're not going to embarrass nobody. This is not about embarrassing. This is about you opening up and letting God come in and help you. So if that's you today and you say, Pastor, look, please pray for me today. Just raise your hand and put it back down. No big deal. We're not going to call anybody out and make you feel like, a, you know, weird or anything. We just want to pray with you. Hey, Pastor, pray for me. I'm going down a road I shouldn't go. I've been watching things I shouldn't be watching. I'm looking at things I shouldn't be looking. My, my schedule's not where I really want it to be. I've kind of yielded my life to things of this world more than I have the family around me. And I just want to be right. I want to get this stuff right. Hallelujah. So if I could have all the dads at least, just stand up where you're at. Just stand up where you're at. I want to pray a blessing over you guys. If you're a dad, just stand up. Hallelujah. Father, we love you today. Father, you see every dad that is standing right now. And Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would touch each and every one of them right now, Father, in the name of Jesus. That, Father, as they stand up, I believe it's a symbolic to them standing up for Christ. Standing up for you, Father. In a world that's trying to pull them down. In a world that's trying to, to get them distracted and get them off, off, off of what you call them to do. I thank you, Lord, right now in Jesus' name. That the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ is coming into them right now in Jesus' name. Empowering them. To even go stronger with you. To go deeper with you, Father. And I pray as they do, Father, their life will begin to speak volumes to those in their family, those on their jobs. I just thank you, Lord, for giving them a supernatural grace to serve you and love for you. I just thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. And if there's a dad standing right now, Father, that is dealing with some issues in their life. I pray right now in Jesus' name that that issue, that addiction, that struggle would be broken off of their life in Jesus' name. And if there's a man standing that their faith is not where it should be with you, Father, that their walk is not with you, 
that they're trying to do life on their own. They're a good person. They treat people good. They're not, they're not evil. They're just trying to do things without you. Father, make yourself real to them right now in Jesus' name. Let them sense and feel the love of God. And I pray right now in Jesus' name that, or that those people, those dads, would simply say, Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord and be my Savior. Help me be the best dad my kids could ever see. Thank you, Lord, for touching these men in the mighty name of Jesus. And if everybody believes that, you say amen, amen, amen. Give these dads a big hand.